Hi there, this is Asian Movie Pulse Interviews, and today I'm joined by international artist and cartoonist Ken Nomura, whose work includes I Kill Giants, which was adapted into film in 2019, as well as the series You Mammy, not sure if I said that right, which was earned him an Eisner Award for Best Digital Comic. Uh, but today we are going to talk to him about his most recent release, which is the Never Open It, um, which was published by Yen Press. Um, so greetings, Ken. Thank you very much for taking the time to sit oh, down and, and talk with me. Real pleasure being here. And um, yeah, looking forward to the, no, looking forward to the interview. Yeah. For sure. Uh, so I want to start off first asking how you got interested in manga and comics, as well as what were some of your earliest influences? Right. So I um, I've been really been reading comics since I'm, you know, I was really I could even be, before I could even read, basically. So, I, you know, we I grew up in a household where there were tons of like books around. Um, and so uh, although uh, that was in Spain, uh, given that my dad's uh, Japanese, we used to have like, you know, having manga around is pretty usual, usual for uh you know japanese households so uh from very little i i was reading there were tons of like magazines um aimed at children that had like uh chapters of like different uh mangas such as like i don't know like uh doraemon for example that would be one of the most well-known ones uh and then later on i would i started reading more like uh, shonen jump so that'd be like more dragon ball and all of that uh, and at the same time, uh, I was also reading like Spanish comics, uh, as well as like European ones like Asterix or Tintin. So, um, so and, and you know, the incredible thing is that um, those were like kind of like the, the titles and the, the authors that got me into comics because, you know, then, you know, I started wanting to like uh, imitate them and that led me to like finally becoming a, a cartoonist. But, you know, for a long time, I haven't really gone back to those books um, and kind of like dismissed them in a way thinking, you know, well, they're, you know, like just like manga or like comics for children. And, you know, they're not like that, maybe that sophisticated. And uh, in recent years, uh, I've gone back to like, you know, some of those like European comics and, you know, Doraemon and others. And, you know, it was a huge surprise seeing that, you know, they were, they were, they were incredible. They were such like high quality titles and um and then you know that's kind of like how i understood that you know as a kid like you there is something whenever there is something that makes you feel like imitating it it's because it's really high quality and it made me feel really grateful for all those authors that have been like making comics for for kids at such a high level um you know in a, in a way that even as an adult you read them and you know there is something to really get out of them Definitely. And uh, do you think that that's kind of affected your your own style, that mix of growing up with uh, Spanish and, and manga, as far as the, the way you tell stories and uh, just the artistic style itself? Yeah, I mean, I don't think it's been like something conscious where at one point I was like, OK, so I'm going to mix these two things that I have around me. It just happened naturally. And um, and I guess like it happens for people that grow up in like um, how would you call that, like, uh, oh, how would you, call, like, mixed culture households, I don't know how you call that. Yeah, that's but, fine, it works. Um, and where, probably from your parents' point of view, they do see, like, a big difference between, like, oh, this is different from my culture, or, you know, this feels foreign in a way, but when you grow up there, uh, all of that, I mean, regardless where it comes from, it's pretty familiar to you, and so at one point, you just, like, you tend to just see like the common threads between yeah things you see and so it's never been to me a thing about like oh western and eastern comics as being as super separated because like i see just so many uh common points um you know because one of them for sure for sure being you know they're like uh vehicles for telling stories and you know that they reach their audience and so i you know, my thoughts just like a result of like naturally assimilating and uh, rather than like taking the distinctive distinctive points of like each one of those 
uh, currents or styles, if you may. Uh, it was more about like just like boiling, not but just instantly. Like, so what do they have in common? And that's uh, even nowadays. I think like the way I I, I approach creating creation, uh, which is more about like uh, how can I can I bridge two things. For sure. uh because i always think that there's something in common rather than like how can how uh rather than like going for the exotic <laughs> thing yeah. of like how can i i don't know um make it like um exotic yeah just for sake of different for sure uh so talking about never open it uh or sorry going moving over to uh, never open it um can you let us know a bit about how it came about and i know in the uh i think it's the afterward you mentioned uh, the amount of research you put in so can you give us a bit of a background on the project and the the uh the research that went into it sure so um never open it uh it's an adaptation of adaptation like free adaptation you, you could say of like three uh japanese legends uh there's in japan like this uh category uh you could say that's called mukashi banashi so it's like old folk tales and you know there are like tons of like stories that you know some of them which are like known uh even abroad uh and you know i as a kid like you just like know them by heart because like you've read them uh they're like anime adaptations some of them have been adapted into movies uh chosen books any, anything and um that was like probably like four I, could, I can't recall maybe four or five years ago uh there was like in um a children's book uh, workshop here in japan uh actually run by uh, an american illustrator uh called stephen guaranaccia he's from new york um and so we had just like one exercise, which was like, okay, so let's try to make like a dummy for, uh, so like a prototype for a children's book. And I remember that I really liked uh, Uma Urashi Mataro, uh, which is the first uh, story contained in this, in this collection. And I just like tried to make it as a children's book. Um, and the problem I encountered, it was like a super interesting workshop and it allowed me to like experiment in many many way, ways but like one thing that i uh my encounter was that whenever i got to the ending and i'm not going to tell you the ending here but it's a pre yeah. the original one is very i find it very <laughs> abrupt very cruel in a way and i i thought so when i was a kid and going back to it as an adult i was like well this is still very i don't know unfair and i just couldn't uh support how to say uh i couldn't um i didn't agree with the ending basically and so i kept on trying like different endings like what if it doesn't end the way everyone says it, it ends because i just find it appalling and the things like when i tried to show it I, I showed it to like a children book uh editor and the editor very kindly told me you know it's a good adaptation the only problem is that the ending, uh, I like it, but we cannot present it to children like this, like we cannot present them with a different ending other than, you know, the original one, mm -hmm. which I understood. And so that's when I thought, well, the only one way I have to maybe realize that like, this idea is to actually make a comic out of it. Uh, and I did like a, like a first, let's say, draft of the, um, of the story that you have on the, on the book. Um, and so for me, that was a very interesting way of trying to analyze, like, why do I not <laughs> agree with this ending? Yeah. And at the end of the day, my conclusion was that as a story that has been being told for, I don't know, maybe, I don't know, 800, 700 years as a vehicle for ancient people telling like, uh, well, you know, interpretations are, you know, of, you know, you can interpret the story in so many ways, but like it's a cautionary tale against something. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you shouldn't be too curious, or you have to value what you have, or many of these things. But I was like, you know, as a as a cautionary tale, yeah, it does work. But the things like it's being told at the expense of the main character, <laughs> I found it very unfair. Yeah. So I, it was like in parallel as thinking like you know there are many there are things that probably are um that we inherit from the past and you know like they and the only reason for them being that way is because it, they've only always been like that and we take it at you know face values like okay so certain things certain values they're 
in a certain way. Uh, but I was more like, well, it could be that maybe, you know, once we've reached the 21st century, there are things that we might want to interpret differently. And so my, my challenge here was like, can I maybe tell this story more rather than the, from the narrator's point of view and be like, okay, so I want to tell you a message. Can I maybe tell this story from the point of view of the character? And like, if I were at their place, what I, would I do differently? What would happen differently if we were really taking care of them in a way? Mm -hmm. And given that there are many, many, many stories of the kind, uh, not even just in like Mukashi Banashi, but if you go to like Pandora's box or in the Bible too. Uh, so anyway, I took like two other stories, the wife, uh, the crane wife. Yeah. And, uh, and one chap episode that I attributed to Ikkyu-san, but it's not really, but you know, well, you know, uh, there's a little bit of like playing there. And I was like, you know, can I take the same approach? They're trying to like, these stories have existed for years and years and years. How can we be on the side of the characters? How can we make them a little bit more human in a way uh, and not uh, sacrifice them <laughs> in order to tell something, uh, in order to, I don't know, like, has like a certain message and yeah. um, so it's just started from them like from the characters and being like what would happen if we really rethought this series from their point of view yeah um i was actually curious about uh, the story the the crane wife um because in the first few pages i thought i was going to read the story of the the snow woman because it's very similar but is the crane wife its own kind of folklore story because that's one I, I've never stumbled across before. But the thing is, like, there are so many variations of all kinds. So many of them, are, uh, they in the case of Japan, they develop differently depending depending on the um, on the region. Okay. And so some of them you might have, uh, and that was like super interesting. Like for, even for the crane wife, I there's a museum. Where is it? Like in. Somewhere around in Sendai, I would say, but I forgot the specific place. But there's uh, the one city where they're supposed, it's not from there, but uh, the most well known version, the one that we know nowadays as the Sun Earth, is from that region. And they built like a museum around the, the folk tale. Hmm. Uh, so I went there, I read many other sources. Um, and it's super interesting because like there are so many variations, like so many different endings and so many different characters appear or don't appear depending on the version. So for me, it was more about like, it's like a free buffet. And I was like, okay, so I'm gonna do yeah. research and see like how many options we have out there, including other tales that then have a com common threads with you know this one here, but are not specifically this one here. Uh, and then I just like, again, boiled down to like the essential and be, was like, okay, so what's really, what's at the core of all the versions and what variations can I maybe take from one or the other? Because, you know, they're kind of like useful for me. Yeah. Uh, so it took me, it was, I mean, thankfully I'm here in Japan, so it's easier. It just a matter of like taking a bullet train and then going somewhere. Yeah. Uh, but it took me a lot of time, but that was so interesting. And then seeing how many, the, for example, it's a movie website. So there's a um, uh, Kongichikawa, who's a Japanese filmmaker. He has a version of um, this folktale. His the name in Japanese was Tsuru, so uh, crane. Okay. It's it's super nice. It's a totally different take from mine, but it makes so much sense in its own way. Uh, there is a Japanese uh, writer, but also like an opera composer that. Uh, so there was like um, a theater adaptation that was done into an opera. Uh, and that again, like it, it's really telling a different story just out of the same ingredients. And that one's like uh, beautiful too. So it was really, um, I mean, such a good excuse to just like spoil myself with just so many uh, children books, the same, there's so many beautiful ones out there. Um, so, and at the end of the day, you know, I was like, okay, so, I'll be happy to make something that, I mean, I'm not even going to attempt to make something as good that, you know, some of the things I read or saw because they were just like uh, amazing. But I was like, okay, I'll try to honor this like tradition of like maybe retelling this story in a different yeah. way. 
that would be good enough. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I think I kind of answered a, a bit of my uh, my next question there, but uh, the, the work definitely does appeal to both uh, younger and older audiences, and it sounds like that was uh, that was a, a conscious decision on your part. Um, as well, or do you think there's something kind of intrinsic about folklore where it's kind of both timeless and can appeal to different generations? Right. Well, this one here, uh, from the very beginning, there, most of the sources I got were, and even, you know, <clears throat> the way I really got to know about this, these tales when I was a kid were uh, children books adaptations or adaptations for children. Um, so although they are pretty, um, how could I say, sometimes cruel, though those are, I mean, it goes the same for Grimm brothers or, you know, uh, many, many other traditions, but they were, they haven't spared them to children. They were like, you know, these, this is how it works. Here you go. So from the get go, um, I would say like, I was really reassured because like sometimes maybe as a creator, you might have this impulse to be like, okay, I need to fit this story in a certain category. Uh, if it were a movie, so rating, is this gonna be yeah. for- A, a G rated or PG rated, yeah. Right, and that's sometimes like, you know, it's a pretty big decision because like that's gonna uh, uh, decide who's gonna watch your movie or read your book. But like for these ones here, since you know I had read so many adaptations for kids, I was like, you know, it's gonna be very difficult for me to make something very uh, gory that you know they wouldn't be able to read. And at the same time, I do remember, for example, when I did so, I did uh, a book you mentioned right before that's called I Kill Giants with uh, Joe Kelly, who's a writer. Uh, that was like twelve years ago, I think. And um, when we did it, wrote it. Uh, for me, it was just a story for adults. And then the year after, it appeared in a number of like um, lists of recommendations for, you know, this year's comic, whatever. And it was oftentimes in the YA category. And to me, that was at first like pretty shocking. And not, not shocking, but I was like, oh, I didn't expect younger readers would be interested in this story. Or even that adults would be recommending this one here because it's all... I mean, yeah, the main character is a kid, but you know, it's a mature story, I would say. So I think there it's probably just you could say maybe natural for me in a way that I I I don't think much about like mm, toning down something when I'm gonna make if if it's gonna be for kids. Uh but probably just because like it's a more, you could say, I try to approach it with like certain honesty. I'm not trying to hide yeah. certain facts. It actually reads fine, even at that, that level. Uh, I do remember myself when I was a kid, I grew up, for example, like two movies that I, I had on VH, VHS tapes uh, where, uh, so Hayao Miyazaki's Naushika and uh, Castle in the Sky. And well, Castle in the Sky is more like all, ages but like Naushka has some pretty gory scenes yeah no problem I mean I, I've been watching them since I was like five no problem so but again like they were they were so such powerful works and so honestly done that you know even kids I think like are able to like go beyond you know probably you know what's at the surface level so um like I said like it's never been like a conscious decision but i do try to make something that a appeals is able to be understood even by people that don't belong to that culture uh goes the same for whenever so i, I have for example like a, a collection of short short stories that uh take place in japan but i was like no i i yeah they do take place in nowadays japan but i want to make them understandable even if you're not uh you don't know japanese culture and i do appreciate a lot. Um, for, for example, like recently, I don't know if you've ever watched um, A Separation, I think it's called in English. I, uh, it's an I don't think so. It's an Iranian movie, uh, which is great. It's uh, amazing. And I started watching it and I don't, I know 
nothing about Iran other than what we watch, so see on the news. Yeah. So I was like, I don't really know if I'm going to be able to relate to what you know this person is telling me here. And the funny thing is, like, because it's a contemporary movie, there's a scene when there's a, I mean, one of the characters they, they have a, an iPhone and the ringtone it's the same as mine <laughs> and i was like oh i know this ringtone i mean oh okay so this is the thing and you know two minutes into the movie you're like okay i don't care about like you know what the background looks like i totally get the story and um and yeah i think that there's like a a, a real storyteller you know it's going to be able to go beyond of those things um it's happened to me too with uh do you know um uh oh what's the name uh oh my god blanked out um anyway so it's a filmmaker from the a hundred years ago he's done the most well known one is the general Buster Keaton okay oh, okay sun silent movies and I was recently watching one that's called I think it's, it's called the student and it's about a uh, college student, he's super clumsy. He goes to college, falls in love with a girl, and she likes the sports, whatever club leader. And so the guy is like, okay, so I'm gonna get into sports and I'm gonna get the girl. And then all the movies are just like silent gags of him, like, you know, not getting the girl. I mean, just not being able to like look cool. And that's a hundred years old. And I was like, it was so shocking. I was like, I totally, know what you mean i was like <laughs> i wanted to get into that time and be like i i know it was like yeah. i know dude 100 years later and it's still the same <laughs> i know exactly what to talk about and so it goes the same for you know time or space uh you know place but you know a uh, good story is a good story and hopefully you know reaches beyond culture or age uh yeah. range I, I do believe folklore is a really good avenue for kind of uh bridging that gap and i know even from my own experience um a lot of my early introduction into japanese culture was from reading folklore like a lot of um a lot of hearn and a lot of his collections and retellings so um i i i think the book uh definitely can appeal across cultures and you definitely succeeded at 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 doing that because i was able i was just instantly drawn into to the work that you did on this one yeah and, and the other thing is like uh for example like when it comes to like spanish legends because you know i was doing some research too there's a little bit less of them but like they're visually less i don't know attractive in a way but like the mukashi banashi like urashi mataro or wife crane or others like visually like you just read them and you're like i want to draw this like there's so much visual it's a feast basically and so uh you know in that sense like japanese folklore is lucky enough that you know whoever came up with these ideas they had like super nice images in mind and you know they still that still like survive to this day for sure um so as far as uh because the the book is was printed in three colors um well white and black and red um and in the crane wise particularly the the use of red is very striking i love the the threads that are are throughout the the book when things kind of go crazy. I'm not going to get too much into the plot, but um, was this always the the plan to use the the three different uh, different colors? And um, was there any particular reason why you picked red? That was in the very first draft of the children book I did for Udashi Mataro. So, you know, the, the box, I mean, the box, box is supposed to be black, but I was like, no, I'm just going to paint it. I mean, when I make it black and white, I'm just going to paint the box red. And hopefully, hopefully the reader will understand, like, mm -hmm. this is not good. And so I just kept it as a um, motif. Uh, and then when I did like a second rewrite and then added a whole lot of like new scenes for Urashi Mataro, I was like, then I'm going to just use red because it, it's good for portraying, or in that case, like blood, basically. Yeah. Um, and so that stayed. And um, I mean, you know, like technically, uh, it's an extra ink, it's two inks. It's sometimes a little bit like complicated to print, although, you know, Yen Preze did an amazing job. So at the beginning, I was like a little bit doubtful, like maybe this is just going to make it impossible to be printed or you know nobody's gonna be interested because they're gonna be like well you know it's an extra ink it's so much extra work 
but uh, you know, luckily for me, you know, you, you know, the guys at Yen, you know, they were interested in it. But uh, it's um, technically it's a little, bit, a little bit more complicated than it looks when it's just printed. But I thought that you know, thematically and as a cue, I mean, it's a very obvious one. Yeah, <laughs> not worth danger. But I was like, this this works probably to underline the basic uh, the basic idea of the book. For sure. And uh, yeah, the Yen Press did a, an amazing job with publishing it. The book itself looks looks very beautiful. So, um, so uh, you've worked in both uh, your, uh, have you worked in like US Canada at all, or you've just worked in Europe and, and Japan as a, as a cartoonist, an artist? No, I actually worked the most, I would say, in the States. Oh, okay. Uh, when it really became a professional site, so the the like I Kill Giant book. I've worked for Marvel and DC a little bit, and for other publishers. So um, um, yeah, it's been a little bit scattered all around. Um, uh, yeah, so yeah, it's amazing. It's, it's, it's okay. I um, for yourself, is there? Do you find that there's much of a difference between working in Japan and working in, in the West? And do you have like a favorite aspect of, of each? Right. So I was, uh, like I said, like I, the, the one work that I consider like my, let's say professional debut is uh, I Kill Giants and that I did when I finished college. And uh, a couple of years after I had, um, I met uh, a couple of like Japanese publishers. They saw the book and they were like, well, this, looks interest, interesting, would you like to maybe try doing something for us? And at that time I wasn't, I didn't know much about writing um, scripts, but what I did know was that in Japan, uh, the way the um, editorial system works, it's a bit different from the States or Europe, I mean, for, from what I knew, uh, in the sense that in Japan, you do have an editor who's, if it were a movie, that would be something in between like a producer, script doctor and um, editor, basically. So somebody cutting the movie. And so it's it's people, but basically they're, they're in uh, as a, um, how do I say, they're let's say like a professional reader. They read your drafts and they suggest like changes, but it's a super, super it's, it's funny because like that ed job editor exists in different, uh, in all the markets. Yeah. But the real world is different. In Japan, like, as I say, like they are really involved in the storytelling. And I was like, if I want to learn how to write stories, I might actually be, I might benefit from having um, a Japanese publisher. And that's why uh, that was like 10 years ago. And funnily enough, although Japan may look like super, technological and everything when it came to comics 10 years ago, until 10 years ago, it was like, either you're going to Tokyo or you, this is just not gonna happen because like they really want to meet face to face. So I moved here and uh, and I released like a short comic, co comic collection. I've done other projects here. And it was very, very interesting because like uh, they're very um, professional and they really push you they're in a way also like a trainer like they yeah they see poten specific poten poten potential in you and they really push you to get there um a very good example of this like you have it in the in the manga that's called bakuman that's also being adapted to like anime and, and tv series and which really describes you know the way uh this works and um and it was like a very 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 good uh learning experience um and the things like in between, you know, I got like a number of like offers from the states uh, to work over there. So at the moment, I'm kind of like coming and going. I'm I'm really just like uh, teaming up with you know whichever publisher from whichever country um, wants to work with me. Uh, that said, for example, like for Never Open It, uh, the original language was actually Spanish. So oh. although it's Japanese legends. I wrote it in Spanish because I, that's the end of the, I, at the end of the day the language I'm the most just like naturally comfortable writing, especially when I'm I'm trying to work fast. Um, but again, that was very interesting because like just because I had to well because I decided to write them in Spanish, I did have a couple of like Japanese publishers editors sorry uh, looking at them, so I retranslated them into Japanese 
got their notes. I got notes from even friends in the States uh, who had never, I'm sorry, translated into English, show them to them. And so I got like different points of view, like from people that knew the original, sorry, I mean, they knew the, the original legend. They were like, okay, so if as a reader, as a person who knows this legend, I would suggest this and that. And from people that know, didn't know it at all. And they were like, well, this is all new. I didn't even know which changes have been done, but they were like all the same, maybe for me, I would do this and that. So uh, it was a pretty, a little bit messy as a pro process, but again, like it, it, well, I think it was really worth being able to get, have so many all of these like uh, different point of, points of view. Um, and like I said, like at the moment, I'm I'm actually working for an American publisher um, in a new on a new couple of new projects. Uh, but you know, there are also conversations about like some stuff happening elsewhere. So you know, it's uh, and you also have like web comics too, you know, which happen in uh, out there. So yeah. it's got to a point where it's getting closer to the um, movie. Uh, film market where you know you have filmmakers from different countries working you know co-productions uh we're gonna shoot in canada but we're from iran so uh in a good sense i think uh it's uh, it's a much more open market than it used to be and so for people like me that means you know so many more like opportunities to just connect with publishers or writers or editors that really are like-minded yeah kind of utilizing the best aspects from different different people and different groups um yeah so not just making it just in japan through the japanese system necessarily yeah yeah okay um so what are some of your own personal favorite comic book series um, or manga series? And is there anything you'd suggest people check out that might be a, a bit lesser known? Yeah, yeah, that's why I was, <laughs> so I put the camera here because I was like, I'm going to take a look at There are two books that I'm lately recommending everyone. Uh, I don't think they're out in the States, but I'm going to, let me see. So this one here. And this one here, they're pretty different, two different tastes. For so this one here, I don't know if it's out in the states. Oh, that one's in, that one's out in the states. I, I'm a oh, huge fan uh, of that one. Yeah. Well, <laughs> this is insane. This is just insane. This is insanity. This is great. Yeah. And uh, there are already uh, twelve issues out in Japan, and this is not even. This is just even getting. Oh, oh yeah, Tracy. Yeah, yeah. Tracy. It's called Blood mm -hmm. on on the Tracks. Here is what they. Yeah, <sighs> it's amazing. It is. <laughs> it's horrible. Um, and you know the uh, prior manga from the same author that's called. Uh, uh, oh, Ak Akunohana. So I don't know. Yeah, the, Air, Air, it's, was, it's Flowers of Evil, which I also have. Flowers. I am a huge fan of the manga for sure. That's amazing too. Um, and it's just. I mean, I don't know what you think, but like for me, the most like frightening thing about the the two books because I find them pretty similar in many ways is that there are many things that I'm like, you cannot make up these things. These no. things you have have seen them, you know, yeah. to be able to buy them, and that's the, what's even most the most like frightening. Like just imagining what kind of life you know these authors. Gone it, it's it's that. very dark, but it's grounded in some sort of realism. Yeah. <laughs> there to me sometimes it's just like faces i'm like you cannot make up this. you cannot invent this face you have to yeah. have seen the expression uh, uh blood on the tracks amazing uh it's, it's just gonna be horrible as a <laughs> reading experience i mean if it were a movie i always compare i mean whenever i introduce it to friends i'm like this would be if, if it were turning to a movie it would be like either uh haneke uh, who's like an Austrian Austrian filmmaker, or maybe in the States, maybe David Lynch would maybe, maybe be able yeah. to make a good movie out of it. Or recently that'd be um, uh, Yorgos Lantimos, who's like a Greek, uh, he's done the favorite, favorite, and he's also very good at like portraying just like insane people. For sure. And uh, yeah, so if somebody likes these kinds of movies, they're gonna have um, uh, a blast. And then the other one, which is like on the opposite, 
side of the spectrum. It's like, so in Japanese, it's Oya Santo Goku. So it's like my landlady and me. Okay. It's like the like a nonfiction book about like, uh, he's a um, comedian on TV here in Japan, uh, kind of known. And uh, apparently for a while, he was renting an apartment at the second floor of a house. And on the ground floor uh, lived his like landlady who's, who was like 80. And it's just like small, stories about like their daily interactions like how she comes to see him or bring him bring him some sweets or they go eat something together even though they are like you know 50 60 years apart and the drawings are they don't look like much but they're they're it's so good it's so good and if this one's already out in the states i really hope that somebody will put this one out here you know, there over there because it's just it's beautiful uh, and it's it's so true, basically. What, I mean, it goes the same for this one here. But like, you look, you read things here, and you know, it's so. so I don't know. It's more like the tenderness that the writer has towards you know that old lady um, really shows in all the comic, and it's really, it's really, really beautiful. Yeah. Uh, and other than that. I mean, I have tons. I mean, if you have time, I would. But these were our kind of like the two that you know I've, that are kind of like somehow recent uh, releases that you know I'm really into. Uh, and I, whenever I have the occasion, I just you know uh, yeah. give it to people. Perfect. Um, yeah. So, sorry, I'm just going over my notes here because I jumped around a bit. Um, well, I guess we can kind of feed into this. Like, it, do you have any sort of dream project you'd like to work on? Because you did mention working for both Marvel and DC in the past. Um, and I know you've done uh, some stories or a story for Spider-Man. And as far as manga, you've also done a story for for Blackjack. Yeah. Um, it, do you have a sort of dream project or, or property you would like to work on? Um, yes. I'm not going to say the name. Just because I don't want to spoil don't want to jinx it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean. But yeah, yeah. Um, it's funny because like when when you start working doing comics as an artist, you uh, working for Marvel, Marvel or DC, it's one of the most like common avenues. Like, okay, you become an artist and you draw this character or the other. Uh, but recently, um, now that I've kind of lear learned how to write. Uh, first of all, I did write like a, a couple of like, short stories for, so at least like two, three projects, I mean, very short ones, but like that I've done for Marvel or DC, I wrote and drew them myself. And it, it was like very interesting, like going going back to those characters, not just in the ca capacity of somebody, somebody who can draw them, but like of somebody who can just like develop something and, and tell something using them. And I now do you understand the, the, the the appeal it goes the same for movies of like taking um, an existing property and well the same as for the Japanese legends but like you take something that's already there and mm -hmm. you tell a different story out of it and I like I said like years ago I wasn't really into that because it was just like so much like the default that as an artist it was fun but it didn't add much to what I wanted to say but being able to, if I were able to write and draw, there are so many properties where I I would like to make something um, out of them because I think, you know, there there are ways that you know in which they connect with the subjects, um, things I tell and everything. But um, I do, you know, and you know, we're talking December from from January. I really have to sit and start. Uh, I've just finished uh, a very big project right now and. I have to sit and start planning the next whatever it is. Uh, but you know, uh, the never opening three three, I don't know if you call if I we should call them short stories, but you know, it's short short story collection in a way. Yeah. So I would really want to like take everything I've learned from that and probably apply it to like maybe an original story uh, and make like one what I would consider for myself like my my debut movie in a way or my yeah. debut book. Where it's like okay now 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 that I learned things let me let me tell like uh, something from scratch um, so you know although I put out many books you know there are most of them short stories or uh, I was uh, 
an, an artist in them. So I really think that, uh, you know, although I'm, I'm already pretty old, but, you know, it's like, well, I think it's really going to be from now on that I really am going to be able to, um, you know, because the things like for, for comics, uh, it, it's funny because like I've been doing it since I was a kid, but it takes so much time to master everything. Yeah. Because in comics, you just work yourself and you're like, you write, you do the prop design, costume design, character design, background design, then you do storytelling. I mean, it, draw, edit, design. Uh, and it takes time to just master everything because like elsewhere in a movie, you would be like, okay, so somebody please take care of the costumes. Somebody do this other thing. In comics, you're just yourself. And the funny thing is that how, uh, at the same time, it's a very simple, medium in the sense that you all you need is a paper and, and a pencil and that's it and you already have a comic or so it's not like you need like cameras and and this and that uh so while being very something because you know even when you make a movie or you're going to make a sculpture most of the time you're going to start from, from a sketch and a sketch is just pen, pen and paper that's it yeah so comics they they stay they keep using that same very raw um, ingredients, if you, if you may, uh, to being created. But at the same time, technically they're very complicated. And I find that after maybe, I don't know, years of like working on comics professionally, only now I have maybe an idea of how to start, you know, really uh, letting out stories that, you know, I would like people I mean, I would like to share with people. Yeah, for sure. Um, so you did mention a, a, you're just wrapping up a, a bigger project. Is that something you can share or is there anything else that you would like to uh, to to mention that yeah, you're working on absolutely. right now? So this one here, the one I finished, uh, I cannot tell you the title, but I do, what I can say, it's it, so it's a new book that I've done with Joe Kelly, who wrote I Kill Giant. So it's really our, although it's like 12 years later, <laughs> it's our second book at last. It's taken us some time, but it's done. It's very exciting. Um, yeah, and it's it's been three years in the making or even more, but you know, it's done. I think it's solid and um, it's a very different taste from I Kill Giants. It's a, Whole different thing but you know we've just put as much heart and, and passion into it so hopefully you know people will like it however i don't really know when it's gonna be coming out because like you know it's you know us kids have already finished having fun now it's adults <laughs> who yeah. like schedule, uh, release schedule so it might actually be 2023 mm. uh hopefully next year but it might be two years from now um but that one's done and um i just i mean i i you know i have stuff there i wish i could show you but you yeah know, um next time we talk hopefully you know have that <laughs> and I can show awesome um okay so it, it's what is the best way for people to to follow you and keep up with the work that your your current projects i do know you have a, an official site but uh, are you on social media as well you know, people can follow you on I am on social media, so I'm both on, I'm pretty much on anything, but basically Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and it's always like Ken underbar underscore. Yeah, underscore, no, yeah. Or Nimura, so like my family name, uh, I'm there. That said, I'm rubbish. <laughs> I don't post, I mean, I don't know how about other people, but I'm like, if I have five minutes, I'd rather use them to making something like a comic or just to take some rest. And so social media is like the, the last thing. I'm really that's that's about. like a good way to go about it, though. So don't worry. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, it's uh, I mean, people will see it's like there's a tweet every three months. And, you know. <laughs> so, um, yeah, if they're patient enough, uh, it should be a pretty quick read because like there are, there are not many tweets out there. Uh, but yeah, basically Twitter, Instagram, and, you know, I'm, I'm maybe as a new year, uh, how you call that? um uh, resolution resolution you know i might start like doing that properly but um yeah it's not my for me yeah that's fair okay well i want to thank you again for taking the time and again 
never open it uh, from Yen Press. It is a very beautiful release of the work. Uh, so I recommend checking it out. And yeah, again, thank you for taking the time. It was a, a pleasure to talk to you and uh, hopefully we'll be able to speak again when future projects come up. Thank you very much for your time. And yeah, looking forward to talking to you again anytime. Thank you, bye. Yeah.